I am here to just talk about my my book, uh, Psyche Culture World. Um, it it really um, well the t my original title I was going to call it existence, but um, trying to capture a broad a very broad topic uh, in the history of ideas, but. Um, the publisher decided that the the, mar the marketing department decided that uh, a, a descriptive title is better than a poetic one or a philosophical one, but they did allow me to at least uh, select Psyche Culture World, which was the subtitle. Um, well, in this uh, in this book, um, it really is a. Uh, collection of some of my writings. Uh, I have like about, oh, I have over 200 publications. So trying to put together a, a book in the history of ideas, um, I had to pick and choose uh, what I wanted to talk about. Um, so I, the subtitle is now called Excursions in Existentialism and Psychoanalytic psychoanalytic philosophy. I, I felt like um, that has really been my project uh, as a, a scholar since um, I received my, my PhD in philosophy. I, I also have a, a PsyD in, in clinical psychology, uh, which I had got first and um, and that led me that led me into different uh, different um, camps. Uh, I, I'm also a certified psychoanalyst, so I, I, I had about I'd say about 18 years of school, <laughs> uh, and um, as a perpetual student, uh, it, it led me in different directions. Um, I, I've always been interested in. Uh, in psychoanalytic thought, it's my my first home. And uh, when I when I was in philosophy studies, um, you know, I, I delved into the original texts of, of many uh, of many people, not just simply um, you know secondary sources. So uh, my my focus uh, looks like my camera is going out on me here. I mean, it's stroke. That work? Okay, for now. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, basically, um, I had specialized in modern to, um, or I should say late, late modern philosophy through German idealism and and then early continental philosophy, along with uh, a concentration in in psychoanalysis, uh, particularly reading uh, Freud's uh, Standard Edition. Um, but I ended up settling with my dissertation in in on, on Hegel and, and Freud, and that was my my first book. Um, called the unconscious abyss that came out of my dissertation, and then over whatever twenty-five or more years now, um, I've uh, slowly been uh, chipping away at certain topics and ideas that have, um, you know, I've had a passion about, and so this book is kind of like putting together these things I, I've done over the years. Um, I, I'm interested in um, the, the nature of the psyche. Uh, I'm interested in the ontology of the unconscious. And um, these, these form my, uh, my, my edifice, but um, I'm also interested in applying that to philosophy of culture uh, to value inquiry, uh, so so leading into um, more social and cultural issues, um, everything from the question, 
and meaning of truth to uh, uh, freedom and determinism to the question of God and evil uh, to um, the issue of disrecognition in our modern world and and also um, how this uh, relates to like bigger questions that um, we don't always ponder or have time to think about. But I, I end the book uh, on the question of, of um, whether or not we're on the brink of human extinction. And that is um, actually the topic of my next book, which um, I called End of the World. Now, whether or not they accept that title is another issue, but um, I've been quite preoccupied with, uh, you know, many of these, these things over the years. So, you know, instead of maybe me reading anything from, from this, um, maybe it might be better to have an open conversation. Um, I, I can certainly go and discuss my thoughts on certain topics, um, but uh, I don't want to, you know, bore you with dense material right now. Tell me what you would prefer. Um, if you want me to go through some chapters or topics or, or just have a dialogue, I perfectly uh, flexible. John, I'm curious of the connection between the topics that you mentioned, the un was it the unconscious abyss and the ecology of the of the unconscious and the connection between the two as you are exploring that. Is that something that would interest anybody else? Just putting that out there. Thanks. I, I think um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, how, how do we go about uh, grounding this in, in a discussion? But the, it, I start from the standpoint of the primacy of the unconscious, not from the standpoint of the primacy of consciousness, which is what, of course, everyone does, except for when psychoanalysis stepped onto the stage. Um, and in fact, not only in one of the chapters of the books, but it, it also reflects a couple of other books in, uh, broadly that I, I've completed in the past. One is called uh, Origins on the Genesis of Psychic Reality. And um, that was a offshoot or a development of applied Hegelianism that I took from my first book, The Unconscious Abyss. And so I wanted to apply a new, a new form of Hegel to, uh, to advance the notion of dialectics that are operative on an unconscious level. And in fact, and not just in the in, in individuals or individuality, but the collective humanity. Uh, I, I was interested in, or I am interested in reconciling the notion of individuality with universality. So the uniqueness of, of every human being and every subjectivity is a fascination, but I must preface it on uh, that I'm more of a metaphysician. I'm more interested about bigger systems and processes. And um, so, so Hegel uh, was more or less, uh, in my opinion, the, the, the real founder of, of process philosophy before Alfred North Whitehead, but with just different methodologies. Um, and so uh, these are like, how do you take into consideration um, the, the primacy of, of psyche and, and apply that to a metaphysics 
of, of, of the world or of the cosmos, um, if we want to go even to that level. So uh, by starting with the premise that we must have whatever aspect of consciousness we have, or feelings or thoughts or you know, perceptions, sensations, uh, affective components, our embodiment, how did we get there? So I use Hegel's dialectical logic as a way of tracing back to some kind of um, what I call ontophenomenology, that there must be an internal process that awakens the psyche. And I, I apply uh, a dialectical method to try and understand the origins of, um, of mind. Now in Hegel's system, he'll take that origin and he'll, he'll apply it to the, the greater notion of, of Geist or, or spirit. Um, and, and what he really means is that, uh, that the psyche permeates the cosmos and um, it's based on a system of logic. Now I won't get all bound into that, but, but the one reason why I like um, a logical model is that um, it can be applied from the inside out, so to speak, and have a certain coherence to it. Um, so my, uh, my attempt was to, to apply this Hegelian logic, but not in a modified way. So um, I'll try to explain in this, briefly what I mean by the dialectic. Um, you probably have heard of the, the notion of uh, the mantra of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Well, that's not Hegel. Hegel did not say that. This is incompetent expositors who didn't really read Hegel, which is not easy to read, by the way. Um, that, if anything, would apply to uh, Fichte's notion of the principles of thinking that he uh, outlines in his um, Wissenschaft Lehre, or the science of knowledge, is the uh, English translation. Uh, but even that little thesis, antithesis, synthesis um, scenario doesn't capture his model of, of the mind either. Um, so, but what, what we do see is a certain movements in Hegel. So you, you, you start with a system where you can enter the system anywhere and it's all connected to the whole but we might not know where we're at in the system until we get to a certain endpoint. And this is what's interesting about Hegel is that it has a certain uh, internal coherence uh, and congruity to it. But at the same time, it allows for contradictions to always manifest. And, and, um, and so in many ways, it's very paradoxical. But you can enter the system anywhere and you should be in relation to some element of a system. And uh, what Hegel does is he starts with, well, just like Aristotle, he starts with logic or pure thought, thinking about itself and its operations. And then it must uh, materialize in nature, in our embodiment and in our environments, in culture, in, in biological realities that are material realities that become more and more um, sophisticated, such as um, the, the invention of culture, of civilization, of, and how everything's a process. And it's a process of becoming. And it's a process of becoming more and more enriched and more sophisticated uh, to the, the degree, to the end where we become 
uh, an ethical, civilized world, uh, unlike our beginning in history. Um, now, of course, we can debate what that means or what that's about. Why does it mean to be civil? Um, but nevertheless, uh, this is what Hegel does, and he and he he sees it through to its end. He we start with the subjective mind, uh, what we would call cognition today. Um, he then um, follows certain dialectical course where it's a progression of where it um, it incorporates elements of itself. It cancels elements of itself and it raises itself to a higher stage. And, um, and so we go from pure subjectivity to an, the object of the objective world, which is what we can call culture. Um, and so within society, within culture, there's um, many different aspects uh, that define it. So whether it be uh, in, in um, socializations, uh, patterns, <laughs> organizations, whether it be the, the ethical, whether it be the aesthetic, whether it be the religious or spiritual, and, or whether it be then in philosophy or pure thought thinking about itself, it comes to its fruition. But it never comes to an end. The dialectic is always operating. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's hard to distill all this, but what I was interested in is it was applying just the logic to um, the Freudian unconscious and how, um, how we can maybe reframe or revamp understanding um, psychic uh, structures, so to speak, but their processes uh, uh, from from the vantage point of, uh, of philosophy. So um, with that, uh, I offer my uh, reflections on how, um, you know, psyche came into being and what I refer to as the Genesis problem. So that would be one of the chapters in the books. Um, I, I also offer, or I have an introduction to Hegel's dialectic, and that leads into another chapter on, on uh, the psyche as inner contradiction. Um, now, over the years, I have, um, you know, I, I have consumed a number of um, uh, books and, and people's systems. So uh, in psychoanalysis, um, I, I've read all of Lacan's work um, in, in English, I should say. Um, and have, I don't, I believe I have a chapter on him in there um, and his system. Uh, I also um, had a, a Jungian turn where I have, um, I would say probably the last 12 years or so, I've been invested in, in uh, a number of critiques of Jung a number of projects and writings and books and things, um, which I'm working into an, another, uh, which will be another book in the future on a critique of Jung. Um, but all of these systems also relate to uh, key, key thinkers in, in uh, history of philosophy and particularly in continental philosophy. So uh, Husserl uh, with the notion of phenomenology uh, even though we could say that phenomenology comes from, let's say, uh, Hegel, um, when he introduces the phenomenology of spirit, so to speak, uh, Husserl really comes on the scene. So I'm, I'm interested in what constitutes uh, uh, a pure phenomenology. I'm also interested in hermeneutics. How do we square our experience and quality of the world um, um, with our understanding interpretation of it. So that I have a chapter on that. I have a chapter of engaging uh, Heidegger and, um, and Heidegger's main uh, project in being in time. Um, but I also have a, a chapter on truth and, and I apply um, 
Heidegger's notion of a return to an understanding of truth that he gets from the ancients, and, and that is the, the notion of aletheia uh, or disclosedness or unconcealment. And, and this to me um, is an interesting turn because um, it gives, or I should say return, because we're, we're accustomed to thinking of truth in certain ways like facts or uh, correspondence to uh, you know reality and things like this. But the notion of aletheia as disclosedness or unconcealment is kind of like a pure phenomenology, what, what appears to us. And hence, if we look at truth, not from this is correct or incorrect, right or wrong, but from the standpoint of what appears, then you can have a, a really a robust theory of truth that's different from more westernized ways of thinking or logic-based ways of thinking. Um, so that's another, um, an, another uh, element. Um, in terms of uh, the human animal, I, I would fall in the camp of someone like um, uh, the ancient Greeks, uh, Schopenhauer and Freud, where there's a, an emphasis on suffering and, and what, what I prefer to call pathos, that to be human for the Greeks uh, was to suffer. And the way we, we come to understand our suffering or suffering of others is mediated uh, by our own uh, human frailties. So that um, also leads to uh, other topics, you know, important topics. Um, is there a God? Is there a transcendence principle? Um, so I don't think one has to have a, um, a, one does not have to be religious or have a belief in um, a certain religious uh, uh, doctrine in order to have a, a spiritual life. And, and I think that um, that's something that's very unique. And what, what Jung would refer to as an individuation process. But um, it also is, it's a, it's a very existential topic. And uh, so Heidegger's in, in and of itself, his, his philosophy is interesting because um, of course, our unconscious mediates um, our being in the world. And, um, you know, you, you have some existentialists who, like Sartre, who was an atheist. You have uh, Heidegger, who brackets the questions, uh, but is very much interested in our being toward death. That informs our relation to uh, existence and living. You have... Um, uh, religious existentialists like um, uh, Gabriel Marcel, who talks about really the, uh, the existential uh, priority of, of having a uh, felt relation to transcendence. Um, so I, I, I engage uh, a number of folks uh, that have written on these topics. Yeah. Um, your phone is delayed, unfortunately. I just got noticed. Marla. Arilla, do you mind? Uh, thank you. So um, that leads us to uh, what, what is evil? That leads us to uh, where are we heading in terms of our future, given that we're watching the planet burn. Uh, we're on the brink of uh, potential nuclear engagement that we have the um, our societies that are in complete and utter turmoil all over the world. Um, and it's, it's in some ways a threatening and frightening thing to have to contemplate. So that's the lovely note I end on. 
um, that if I were a betting man, I'd say we're on the brink of extinction. So uh, Susanna, I hope I didn't uh, meander all over the place and I answered your question. I think you offered a, a, a enough threads to braid together to get a basic understanding of where you're going. So thank you. Thank you. John, I might have one question just to enter in here. And that is, you seem to start with the process of the psyche, the processes of the psyche, the unconscious, and you manage through Hegelian logic to work all the way up to civilization and the cosmos. But how about going back? How about going down even further materialistically? How are these processes related materialistically? How are they related? How, what is their origin materialistically, evolutionarily, you might say? Um, how do we pose them or see them in that context from your point of view? Or do you just say, like Freud in a way, we have to start here because that's, that's all we know at this point. Well, that's a, a great question, and it's a very convoluted one. Um, so it sounds like you're really asking about the mind-body problem, mm -hmm. um, which actually was one of the books I published last year on uh, as a edited book, in which I was um, delighted to hear won the Gradiva Award this year. Um, and so Congratulations. I do, thanks. Um, I do try to uh, address that question more in that in that book uh, in, in a couple of chapters on one is on a critique of materialism. Um, so I guess I, I, I would situate myself um, as a person who I'm certainly not a reductive ontologist or reductive materialist in any way. Um, at the same time, how can we deny the fact that we're embodied, that we're in soul, so to speak? Um, now, if you want to boil everything down to physical structures uh, or processes, which is what is in vogue in most materialisms, um, trying to say that uh, you have to have a material substrate or a basis or a physicality for mind to emerge from. Uh, so you have um, various theories of emergence. You could do that, um, but it also has all kinds of problems with it. I, I, I think I try to elude it by applying, again, uh, a dialectical logic to that these processes, they can't just exist independently as parts floating out there. They have to be connected to, to the whole organism. So if we're talking about the human organism as, in terms of our mind or psyche, um, but the fact is, is that because we're embodied, who, who is going to deny that? I mean, there are people that want to say, you know, the soul detaches from the, the physical uh, uh, body at, at death and has an afterlife and uh, has an immaterial transcendence to it and, and all of that. Um, and you have forms of um, Neoplatonism and panpsychism and um, uh, cosmic psychism that, that it try to account for the parts within the whole. Yeah. So th this is not really the aim of this particular book uh, or to answer such uh, um, monumental questions that, okay. <laughs> but, but I mean, like there are like, for instance, let's say, you know, as a, as a, 
as somebody who's made a career as a critic, um, take the, the relational uh, psychoanalyst analytic movement. So where you'll have people that will deny the nature of drives or, or tree, tree uh, in us, or does, you know, that uh, we have an embodied desire. Not everything is about, you know, um, human relatedness, even though we could say it, it obviously has to include uh, human relationality. Uh, but um, yeah, some people would want to deny the existence of, or the prime, certainly the primacy of, of, of um, biological processes like drives or instincts. Uh, when I think really it's about emphasis, um, where do you place the emphasis? Um, but we were desirous people, creatures. Um, and I do have a, a thesis on what desire really is. It's, it's in my view, it's about being in relation to lack. Yeah, I saw that phrase in your first chapter. And, and we lack uh, and we want, and, and yet when we have, when we have one wish fulfilled, another one will pop up. It's an endless uh, appetite. And, and yet our desires are always uh, complicated. Uh, we always, they're in competition with one another. They, they cancel one another out. They, uh, this is the nature of resistances, of defenses, of internal conflict or complexes, whether they be in the self or in society. So, um, and yet they're embodied. So, so of course we live in a material world and, um, and a greater cosmos. Of, uh, hence, that, that, that conflict, that bubbling up process, that constant turmoil that you talk about is actually relatively common when you read many of the researchers in consciousness right now. And that's, that's a pattern. That's a pattern that's very much in process, you might say. And that, of course, occurs throughout all the living world, the process of persistence, of getting energy to continue to be negentropic, to, to persist and to follow through with all of the conflicts life has with non-life, with the, with the universe in order to persist. So I just, I just found that interesting. I just wondered if you had thought about that at all or were paralleling yourself in any way with a lot of the uh, recent consciousness research that's been going on. Well, um, you don't like that word consciousness research because you emphasize the unconscious. I understand that. That to me is a, a bit of a word game um, because what they mean by by consciousness is what you would call psyche, uh, the whole the whole mind. Okay. Yeah, I, these are important. Um, you know, definitions to get to have a certain base to have even conversation about so uh, right. even if, if we look at consciousness on a continuum or on a spectrum right. one, one might have a different conversation too because that would allow for unconsciousness but but then we'd have to define what we mean by unconsciousness in right relation to to conscious um yeah i know that my actually my next book is called uh, Archetypal Ontology, and it's coming out um, uh, in March. And uh, it, it's it, it's co-written by myself and a, a Jungian psychiatrist, Eric Goodwin. And so the book is really an attempt to answer your question, Booth. It, it's we we are we're starting from what is, um, what is an archetype or what is archetypal, and it leads us to the whole cosmos in our, in our uh, dialogue. 
Um, now, Eric, Eric has a view of, if I would, it's, it's like a panpsychism that's applied to, uh, to everything in, in, in that's cosmic uh, or the, the entire universe, so to speak, um, and whatever we ponder it to be. His conclusion is um, that mind comes from this, really this cosmic psyche that is responsible for how our psyche can even be in relation to it. Whereas I, I start from the bottom, meaning the, the unconscious uh, and trying to answer what is an, what is the essence of the arch, of an archetype and, and the archetypal. And that leads me to a higher structure of mind. But I, I don't take the neoplatonic leap to the one. No, um, I, I like your approach. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I know the my limitations. Uh, that so but but Eric, uh, he's it's it's an interesting read nonetheless. Yeah, I'll look forward to it. John, could I ask you a follow-up question to what you just said? Oh yeah, sure. So what you just mentioned is coming your your approach coming at it from a you didn't say systems point of view, but I'm I'm allowing for that possibility. You can correct me if I'm wrong. That the notion of archetypes might be our ham-handed way of referring to larger orderly uh, constellations of something, consciousness, energy, uh, because of the very nature of the uh, organizational principles and the emergent properties that are happening within the universe. Is that clear? Yeah, um, definitely I would agree that I would say that basically everything is a about process systems and that these these take place on various strata of of whatever we want to discuss whether it be mind or society or or bioscience or physics i i would imagine i i guess i would just have to ask is any could anybody even have a, a theory that wouldn't take into account process and if, if it's just a basic mechanism um, of a simple, you know, um, material and efficient causal scheme um, that doesn't allow for complexity, doesn't allow for, um, you know, formal final causality to use Aristotle, um, or doesn't allow for complex systems to, uh, to emerge, develop, and intertwine, then that seems like to be a problematic theory. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I had another question too, if you don't mind, uh, unrelated. Well, is I think probably related somewhere. Um, I was first introduced to your work through a Jungian lens because I was studying uh, to become a Jungian analyst. And, um, I found your, your um, analysis and critique of Jung to be very heartening, you know, and I look forward to the new book coming out. Uh, my question has to do with uh, Jung's uh, postulation, his project on the transcendent function, that it seems like he was making the attempt to bring consciousness and unconsciousness together. And, you know, he understood, I think he understood to some degree the dialectical process, but more he was coming at it through um, uh, clinical phenomenology, if you will, and his own you know, life, of course, too, that he could bring those together, even in a momentary way, that there would be uh, um, a final harmonization of those two that he could rest his mind in. I'm, I'm, specula I'm, I'm speculating, he didn't say that in his work, but I'm thinking that's where he got to at times, and that he knew that that was possible from his own personal experience and led him to write books like The Transcendent Function. What's your take on what he was trying to do? Yeah, well, um, 
thanks for letting me know about your background. It helps me uh, orient. Uh, it's, it's also another coincidence is I just, uh, I just have, a, I just finished a paper called Young, um, Young on Transcendence. Oh. <laughs> so, so uh, um, I'm shopping that out to journals now. Um, the transcendent function, as you know, is, is a paper that he, he gave at a, a talk and it got shuffled away in his desk and was published late in his life. Um, but he, it, it, it very much is, I think, an, his attempt at dialectics. And mm -hmm. we know that, that Jung read Hegel and we know that he did not like Hegel. He thought he was a, you know, schizophrenic, I even wrote. <laughs> megalomaniac uh, in terms of his ideas, but um, Jung is looking, he's always, he's always been preoccupied and, and throughout his whole life, I think, with the notion of, of opposites, mm -hmm. the coincidence of opposites, uh, the, you know, the concurrence of them, the, the omnipresence of them, there, especially in his later works um, before he died, uh, were were part of his probably his own self healing as well. So dealing with these inner contradictions, dealing with these opposites in, in our psyche and, and our impulses and consciousness and nature and things. Um, what's he? He doesn't necessarily have a Hegelian, um, you know, uh, sublation. In, in Hegel, you've got a, a higher, you know, order that you've achieved by subsuming the the lower relation and the higher. He, Jung struggles with maintaining attention of the opposites rather than trying to integrate them. Um, and in many ways, I like that because now we can talk about theory all we want, such as the you know, like unification uh, or the unity of things, uh, the integration, the holism, of, uh, you know, of, of stuff. But we don't experience it that way. Um, it, it's good on paper. But even in those moments of satisfaction where we don't feel a sense of conflict, um, it's merely a moment. Something introduces itself, and, and whether it be the dialectic of desire that creates another movement, uh, we are confronted with a counter movement. We're, we're, we're confronted with the complexity of trying to integrate opposition, but at the same time, annul opposition, at the same time, resolve it. And um, so I think. And I, this is why I read Jung as an existentialist. He's, you know, he struggles with that just like we all do, and in different ways and different manners. Um, the one, I think, the one interesting thing is that, you know, Jung is the one who really focuses on the religious uh, or spiritual instinct and how important that is. What are, even in philosophy, you know, if you call, if you're interested in transcendence, you're interested in um, a non-religious uh, spiritual dimension, uh, you're interested in aesthetics, ethics, this can all be very, very much a spiritual pursuit. So um, that's why I think, you know, Jung has a lot to contribute. Um, and I hope I haven't gone too long and winded everybody out, but hopefully I responded to your question. You did, thank you very much. I was also looking to send you a picture of the, uh, the mushroom cloud that lifted up over the, um, the uh, uh, railroad car in Ohio as a very ominous sign of end of times, it seems that you were talking about earlier, but can't yeah. quite figure out the technology, how to put that up on the screen. Well, that's, Terrifying. that's a, 
tragedy. That, that certainly is. Yep. Thank you, you need to get John to sh um, share hosting with you, and then you can uh, go to share, share screen, but you need to be co-host. Well, that's okay. I, I'm not sure I want to give other people a more horrific image of what we're headed for. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> Any other thoughts or reflections? John, I mentioned to you all I did, I've all I've done so far with your book is to read the first chapter, but I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the, um, how you see the distinction between the processes of the ego and the it. Those two processes, forget conscious, unconscious for a moment, you, you describe them as processes. Yeah. How are they different? Well, um, you know, Freud was equivocal about this at times because he, you know, to be fair, he, he never felt the need to think the same thing all the time. So his, his theories were evolving. Um, so uh, at at first, you do a nice job of that, incidentally, with Freud. I, I really enjoyed that, that historicity you put in and that thought evolution. That was great. It's really good. Thanks. Um, to differentiate them, um, well, really, the ego or the I must come from the, the, the id, the it. Um, according, particularly for, for Freud's model, but from a dialectical model too, that the, but the ego can still be, and still is, largely an unconscious function. Not, it's just not the sense of self of, of our conscious experience only. I mean, think, think of the time, I mean, there's so many different examples but um when we're when we're asleep you know uh there's a merger of the two and and, and if we're self reflectively aware that we are aware of our sense of self in that slumber state uh of unconsciousness uh you know that the, there there is a mediation of a, of a sense of self and so uh, it's, a it's about degrees of manifestation and how they appear. So um, this is why I thought Freud's model is extremely uh, important to retain because he, he allows for all these dimensions of psyche to be unconscious and not just conscious, but the I, or superego, I mean, they're all operative. Uh, but if I was understanding you correctly, and I'm probably not, and feel free to correct me. <laughs> You're saying that in, in the growth of the individual, the infant, there's a point in there where the unconscious, that, that part of the unconscious that becomes the I, I don't, it doesn't split off, but it recognizes itself as different. It sees itself as an object the subject object occurs, that, that occurs. This process distinguishes itself in some way. That seems to me to be a critical moment and trying to understand that moment, how does it relate to a chimpanzee or how does it relate to a dog or all the rest of life out there? How does that particular moment in human life how does that process, number one, how is it differentiated from the unconscious that it evolved out of? Yeah, um, well, good, good questions. Um, I, I can't speak about um, others, meaning dogs or chimpanzees or, or amoeba or things like that. Uh, sure. But, but there must be some, if the, dia, if the, the dialectic, is actually something that permeates the universe. 
um, then why wouldn't it apply to everything on, on just on a different level and a different scale? Mm -hmm. um, so, so the notion of, um, I agree with that, but I'm just, I'm just curious to know what your thoughts are. Why, why are humans different? We're talking about the extinction of civilization here. That's not particularly good, right? So I'm just saying, what is it about this event that occurs with humans that actually seems quite wonderful and quite dangerous at the same time? And, and what is the distinction of that process? What is it? Well, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer for you, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a damn good questions. Um, I, I certainly can't uh, resolve it, um, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't be looking at these these things. Oh no! Oh, I agree. Yeah. Um, I agree. Could I could I be presumptuous to chime in, not with a solution, but with a response? Sure. I certainly don't have the solution to your problem, Booth. I mean, I think it's the human problem. But I also think you were saying earlier, John, that it has to do with the, the, the question of the problem of evil and, and how we can address and um, I don't know what the dialectical term would be, but to work with uh, evil as we understand evil or, or that, that very basic human tendency to self-destruction. That's a complicated topic. I, I try to meander through that topic uh, in different ways, looking at what philosophers have said. And I end up landing on the a metaphysics of violence. Mm -hmm. and, and if we look at, if we look at that and apply it to human beings, um, there, it's as if it's uh, the notion of the dialectic again, mm -hmm. that you always have to have conflict. Conflict generates everything. And uh, conflict is then subsumed. It's transmuted. It elevates itself um, to another level, such as a higher level, let's say, of self-consciousness, of the fact that we have law and order we used to not. The fact that we are largely cooperative and not just killing each other. Um, so there, there's a lot of, you know, connection, whether it be to, you know, evolutionary biology or whether it to be to um, the formation of societies and cultural systems to, to uh, politics, you name it. I, I would think that there would be an application. But yeah, the notion of violence, uh, the, the, that how do you remove something when it's also a necessary or essential aspect of, of a process system? Mm -hmm. So you can't, you can modify it, shift it. Um, what's gonna happen when we have, uh, when we let's say have 10 billion people on this planet we're gonna have uh, at least 20% multiplication of, of, of tendencies for human aggression to flourish. Um, so uh, the other thing about evil is that I strip it, I strip it from a, the, uh, a theodicy. Uh, I'm not really interested in looking at it from terms of a religious question. Um, but I also think that we all are evil. We, it's, it's part of our essence. It's just the way it manifests or the way it appears. And, um, and that, so we can't really remove it uh, or surgically, you know, take it out of who we are as uh, in terms of our psyches. Uh, but it doesn't mean we can't alter it, modify it, change it. And I would think through, you know, ethical self-consciousness is the contender here.
there's it's interesting like you know how people particularly not in the profession will talk about evil and talk about bad things and I mean, they're the, the least likely to, to want to admit to their own human nature, such as, well, yeah, I have fantasies of killing people or, you know, these types of things that we would take for granted uh, and, um, you know, or having horribly hateful, aggressive fantasies. Uh, um, and yet we don't act on them, uh, or at least some of us, <laughs> um, even so, but we can't deny the the impetus or the the you know the the, the drive or the the urge itself. It is has to be accepted and, and modified, mutated, etc. Um, that's why you know, like uh, one of my favorite aphorisms from Nietzsche is that. Uh, Suicide is a powerful comfort. It gets one through many a dreadful night. Yeah. So um, just try to be a better person. I think that's uh, my solution uh, to myself as I am quite flawed and, and yet I, I have to keep trying to improve. Well, thank you for that, John. I have to get to a client, so I have to leave, but I really appreciate your time today and everyone's time in this, this conversation has been great. Well, thank you. I appreciate taking the time. I, I got the book. I'm going to read it. Okay. Well, thanks for your support. Appreciate it. Bye now. All right. Bye, so right. I think that's a good time to stop probably. So thanks again, everyone for coming. Appreciate your support.